There we go. Okay. So, uh, we're in the middle of page 19. The psychologist's hybrid thinking runs the risk of introducing into the description along with the objective world, reducing into the descriptive relationships belonging to the objective world. So that's what it looks like he's thinking about what Wertheimer is thinking. But then he goes on for pure description. And Gestalt theory claims to be a description. The contiguity and resemblance of stimuli don't precede the constitution of the whole. Now, this is an important sentence. Good form is not brought about because it was good. It, it would be good in itself in some metaphysical heaven. It's good because it comes into being in our experience. This he says every once in a while. This, there's, there's no reason why a certain figure is, is a stable figure or that our perception tends to, for instance, separate out the trees from the masts of the, of the boats. Uh, it's, but the fact that we organize our experience that way is what the Gestalt people call a good experience, a balanced experience, an uh, uh, experience that's come to its kind of stable form. And there's nothing that it's conforming to, no rule or principle or uh, uh, way of stating why this is the best gestalt. It's the best gestalt because it looks like the best gestalt. And, it, and other gestalts tend to be grouped as less good by anybody looking at it. And that's, that's what he's saying here. And, and they, are, they shouldn't have tried <coughs> to find objective reasons for these uh, experiences to, to come together in this way. The way they come together, the Gestaltists should describe, but there's no story why experience has to come together in this way, why it's better in any way except that it looks better. That's what that sentence says. But it'll come back again and again, that there are no norms outside the Gestalt psychology. The psycholo Gestalt psychology just describes the norms that are in our experience, period. Uh, now, where are we? No, 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 just a second. 19. Have I done? 1, 2, 3. So he sums up at the bottom of 19, if we confine ourselves to phenomena, the unity of the thing in perception is not arrived at by association, but is the condition for association, and as such proceeds with the limitations which establish and verify it, and indeed proceeds itself. And that's the story about how you you, once you've got it, you've got all you need. Uh, so, and, and here's, the, here's that business put most clearly at the top of 23. Thus, the appeal to memory presupposes what it's supposed to explain, the patterning of data, the imposition of meaning on a chaos of sense data. Now, the punchline, no sooner is the recollection of memories made possible than it becomes superfluous since the work it is being asked to do is already done. I've explained that, right? That, the, that is, if it, are, if it looks like it's the front of a house so you can associate it to the back, then it already looks like it's the front of a house. <coughs> so there's nothing for you to do about it. You've done it. Home. And this is all part of the basic notion, which I want to keep reminding you, that the whole determines what counts as the elements. That's always there in the background of what he's thinking. Uh, I think I have read anyway. Well, he says at the bottom of 18, in effect. I read it already. There are, there are not arbitrary data which set about combining into a thing because de facto proximities or likenesses cause them to associate. It's on the contrary because we perceive a grouping as a thing that the analytic attitude can discern likeness and proximities. That is, remember, always the whole determines what counts as the part, and the whole determines what counts as similar to what. And if you look in an analytic way at that, that is, taking it apart into the elements, you lose the whole, you lose the, the experience altogether. Now, there's this be the beautiful boat example is, I just don't think I have time to read it, but on page 20, it's where he talks, of, he describes in detail what it's like to see something, see what he's doing on 20, I should say. And I think I said this maybe already. Did I do, do well the vote example already? Since the no, you did it slightly. Slightly. Different. And here, well, here it is spelled out. But what's interesting about it is he slows down uh, experience. He's so good at finding examples. Last time I remember talking about the museum example, mostly. But here he's slowing down the example of coming to perceive an object. 
in which you start with what he calls a vague expectation and uh, then it, it, pull, it stabilizes into the ship and the mass and then as he says right after vague expectation in the middle of the paragraph only afterwards did I recognize as justification for the change the resemblance and contiguity of what I call stimuli that is we see that it's only in once you've already seen it as masts and uh, trees then you can see the trees are similar to the trees and the mass is similar to the mass but that you have to first you get the sense that there's some way to gestalt it and then it falls into place presumably on the basis of past experience you've had with masts and trees and then you can see only then the whole determines what counts as the similarities and what's interesting about it is that this is supposedly happens all the time every time you walk in here and see the lectern you you do it but you're so used to seeing lecterns in general and in this case this one in particular that only takes a few milliseconds to do it whereas when you see a weird scene like that it takes a long time I worried about that and I thought maybe this is philosophy craziness you ought to be very careful not to say well it, when you don't experience it all it must be because it happens very fast so I worried about that so I asked Walter Freeman who's always there thank goodness in the background we're doing his grain Merleau-Ponty and he said he told me how many microseconds it takes to recognize an ordinary familiar object and he said yeah that's not wrong it, he is just slowing down what we can actually read off is going on during these microseconds that that the object stabilizes well, well, first, yeah. the, the exact example is that he's walking along a shore toward the ship so it seems like if you're laying something from far away you really can't just slow it down like we're not slowing down the microsecond of view because you're just right there so right to terminate but it seems like no, no, I don't think you're, so. you're walking slowly. Yeah. No, but I don't think he is. Isn't that funny that everything we talk about turns into a puzzle? I think he's standing there. But have to look. He says, I walk along the shore towards the ship. You're right about that. But, but I still think that it's not because he's getting... Well, you're right. You're right. As I approach. You're absolutely right. And the so, tension lowers. Yeah. There's, at a distance, it all is confused. As I get closer, it, it sorts itself out. I think the tension increases as you get closer up to the point where it sorts itself out like a storm isn't that what happens well, at some point it decreases yeah oh well, the thing suddenly it. falls into place like the storm which has been brewing hits and then it's all organized that's right and well, that doesn't disagree with what I'm saying except that I didn't mention that but it's true it doesn't just magically see it could have he, he slowed it down by my walking from a distance that's right just as in a museum he slows it down by walking up to by looking at unfamiliar paintings but it could just be you're staring remember he mentions the rabbit and the hat in the trees that kind of puzzle you're staring at this kind of puzzle and you know that it doesn't look quite normal and you know it's really something else and uh, you've got what he would call a vague expectation and then boom it gets to be sorted out and there's the rabbit and the trees and the hat he could have told that story if the, the story is of seeing something unstable uh, the rabbit and the tree in the head are pretty stable I think we need a third example I doubt if I can just grab one what we want is something that without you having to walk toward it looks unstable it happens all the time the Dali painting, yeah, a Dali painting can do that right Dali's very good at that where it, it looks weird and sort of and then you see it's two ladies with strange hats that, uh, and, as well as George Washington or whatever that one is <laughs> but, uh, but also I wish it's a challenge for next time this happens I, I enjoy noticing it because it happens a lot if you want to start reading Merleau-Ponty in the simplest situations you see things that look puzzling and not quite right and it turns out to be some somebody's put something where it isn't supposed to be or the, the cat has or something and you get this unstable thing and then it falls into place it's not an, uh, an, uh, as, uh, as unusual as it, we make it seem he's got another one that, that may be not so unusual but again I think you're walking along in that where you see what looks like a patch of uh, a stone on the path and you're all prepared to step on it as a hard supporting stone and it then it turns it what it turns into a patch of sunlight that and uh, but that's not so good either because it was looking happily like a stone I can't think of it but I'll work on it yeah I just want to clarify are yeah. you saying that because this is a very common experience 
we have reason to believe that it always happens even when we don't have this? Well, I think we, yes. I think that plus Walter saying so. I, would, I don't think it's, it wouldn't be fair to just get one neuroscientist on your side. So he tells you, yes, this happens a lot, but I think he needs a claim. He makes a stronger claim. Let's get that clear. Not only does it happen a lot, it happens all the time. Your experience is constantly having to be stabilized. You don't think he thinks that, and you don't think he should think that. Well, I don't see how we could think that, because if you don't experience it, how could it be the case that your experience has to do that? If you want to model the brain as trying to figure out what you're seeing, maybe the brain finds itself undecided about what you're seeing all the time. But of course, you don't experience it. Well, I you experience it unconsciously. Well, I think. Well, I, 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 this is the problem I was dealing with. I think he thinks that you experience it so fast you don't notice it. And only on some circumstances <coughs> can you slow it down enough to see it happening. But I think he thinks it's happening all the time. Except when you're when seeing familiar objects in familiar places, it doesn't take you long enough to see it, to get it together, that you can notice it. But it, so he has to give you uh, breakdown, well, not quite breakdown, but, but hard cases in which it takes you a while. But I think it's his claim that that's how experience works. It's constantly we're moving from this kind of instability to getting a clear grip on things. Uh, it's a, keep your eye open for it. Whether I, maybe I'm making this up, but I, I can't imagine. I mean, I don't understand how it could be otherwise for him because we are composing the text of the world, to quote him. Now, I'm just describing, I'm just taking the metaphor. We're always composing the text of the world, I think. Just, it was just that you've got it slow down with those mass and trees, the composing. Well, I thought that your view yeah. is that most of the time, we're not thinking about our experience, we're just interacting with the world. Absolutely. Our attention is focused on the world. Absolutely. So none of this is going on. Ah. Well, that's, it's, it, when you do the breakdown thing, then it's, it's abnormal in that you're puzzling and you're paying attention. But the puzzling paying attention, ooh, this gets us right to the attention chapter. I mean, the question is sort of to what extent your puzzling kind of paying attention reveals something that's going on all the time, only it's, on, it's totally marginal and it happens very fast. But it's always you composing a meaning, meaningful objects out of uh, what is uh, not clear. Uh, I, I, I'll go. Let me put it on hold for the uh, attention chapter. Because he, he, he never says if you stop and think about it. He just says that as you move about it, it comes to more or less clarity. Good point. So in, in this example of let's say the museum of the painting, you don't stop and think, huh? The things don't look right. You just can automatically move closer or less. You don't think about it, but it is part of your phenomenal experience of the painting. It is your moving about trying to get the best possible view of it, you know, trying to avoid the glare, like if it's a protective piece of glass. So that, I think that's what he's saying is constantly going on, and that is constitutive of the experience of the mass of the trees or of the painting, of you know, looking at a museum. Or you know, looking around the yeah, whole cluster. Good. I think that's good. And in the museum one, I shouldn't have said that you're sort of puzzling about it in a reflective <coughs> sort of way. You're just uh, um, feeling uneasy about it and moving around to, to get it clearer. Uh, that's and that you don't have to reflect on uh, as, on it as a puzzle to do that. The point, you, you said it well. You just are doing it. Then he reflects and asks you to remember what it was like with a like a storm and that it, it was uh, a puzzle in effect and that it all of a sudden got solved. That's him giving you a much more reflective view of it than you have when you're doing it. That sounds right. Okay, back to where we are. Uh, so we did the boat example in a hurry. Uh, well, uh, so how do we do it? I, I jumped ahead, but I'll read you a quote. Well, we do, we do it, that is, how do we get an experience of meaningful objects? Because we're already in this meaningful world. Uh, I, here's a place where he's saying that, at the bottom of 25. Consciousness can, about 10 lines from the bottom, in the course of time, modify the structure of its surroundings. He's going to talk about that. Well, we want to know, let's back up, we want to know how 
by its own vitality and without uh, carrying complementary material into mythical unconscious, consciousness can, in the course of time, modify the structure of its surroundings. How at every moment its former experience is present to it in the form of a horizon which it can reopen if it chooses to take the horizon as a theme of knowledge in an act of recollection, but which can equally leave on the fringe of experience and then immediately provides the perceived with an atmosphere and a significance. All that is to say that the meaningful, relevant similarities and so forth are there on the fringes of consciousness for him, in the background and so forth, but they notice they provide the perceived with a present atmosphere and significance. I mean, it's because all this past experience isn't remembered. It's really part of the visual field on the horizon, on the, on the, uh, on the periphery, in the, in the background, that it's leading you in some direction and giving you some relevance. Let me see if we go further. A field which is always at the disposal of consciousness and which for that very reason surrounds and envelops its perceptions. An atmosphere or horizon, if you will, a given sets which provide it with a temporal structure. I'm going to say more about that later. That, that right now I just want to say there's always this background in terms of which whatever's in the foreground is getting its significance according to him. Uh, do I really want to correct a mistranslation at the bottom of like this? Uh, well, on 24, I have to tell you, there's a lot of mistranslation, or at least one word keeps getting mistranslated about, two, about a third of the way down. It's where it's all about sensation, source of sensation in the next, the, and then the how experience in which the meaning exactly fits the sensation. You see what we're talking about? Let me back up. The illusion deceives us and passes itself off as genuine uh, perception, precisely in those cases where the meaning originates in the source of sen sensation. I don't even know what that means. But in, 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 in the, the French doesn't say sensation. The French says, not, it doesn't say sensation, it says sensible. The sensible is his word for sense experience. But it's meaningful sense experience, not uh, sensation, which is impression. And nothing, or no meaning originates from an impression. And then he goes on in the next sentence, it, it, it intimates that privileged experience in which the meaning exactly fits the sensation. No meaning fits the sensation. He's just been arguing that. The sensation has no meaning. Again, it's the sensible. And he goes on again. Uh, it implies this norm of perception and therefore cannot spring from any contact between sensation and memory. Well, there, that's also sensible. It could have been. And it, it, they all are. Uh, until you get the word sensation in the right place. A little further, the projection of memories makes nonsense of both. For if a thing perceived were made up of sensations and memories, there is sensation. That is, those are the impressions. Well, it's too bad, and I don't know how often it happens, but you've got to distinguish between impressions, which are sensations, which in French is sensation, and uh, perceptual experience, which is meaningful, and which is what you're having all the time, which he does think exists. In fact, he's got a whole chapter on it. And that's the sensible, and it's a disaster that the translator doesn't see that that's an important distinction. But I don't remember any place, I didn't see any place else where this bad thing happened. So, but keep your eyes open. If you read something that looks wrong, come and talk to me about it or, uh, and when I, in, in office hours, and we'll look it up in the French and see about it. Okay, onward. Question. Yeah. Uh, the word meaning bothers me. Like meaning of quality sounds too rough. Okay. Yeah. I always sh I shouldn't say meaning, although he does sometimes. Again, it's sort of sense. It's, it's significance. Where me the minimal sense of meaning for him, the, which is the one he's using, is something that points beyond itself. It gets whatever uh, value it has or perceptual quality it has or something from the whole, uh, like the front of the house looking like the front of a house because of the back. And it, it does seem strange to talk about me, meaning, a, a meaning, and he doesn't, I mean, the word again is sens, so but there's got to be something that refers beyond, that's what keeps it from being a mere impression, which has no 
physician <coughs> in a whole and no reference to other uh, parts of the experience that make it what it is. Does that help any? No. Okay, why not? But I, don't, I guess I didn't get your problem. S significance in the sense of signification? Like it's actually doing like reference? No, exactly. It's not. That's the, I, thought, I thought I understood you, but I haven't answered you. Meaning, and if, if significance, if those mean reference, if that means that you've got some kind of intentional content and it's referring to something beyond that content, that's much too conceptual. He, but he thinks, take the figure on the ground. What he wants to say, the figure doesn't refer to the background under it, but it looks the way it looks because it looks like it has a background under it. And it doesn't refer to the edges being more dense than the center in the sense of somehow pointing at them like objects. It just looks the way it looks because it's got uh, because it's experienced as a spot on the <coughs> ground. There's, there's a kind of... Uh, it isn't even intentionality. I mean, it isn't even body intentionality, which he does believe in. It's something even more primitive than intentionality, because intentionality can fail. I mean, that's part of what it is to have intentional content. This isn't like... You, it isn't like you... You, you get it wrong. I mean, you can't look behind the spot and see, wow, there was no background under the spot after all. It, it, it just, it's just built into the look of the spot that there's a background behind it. It's, does that help any? Paula, so is the, signifi the significance of socks, does it mean signification with like intentionality in it? Is no. It, is it closer to um, uh, like, like deep? Backgroundish relevance. Yeah, it's the, it doesn't. But it doesn't help. It's it's the way. In the, uh, let's try this. If the if the whole determines the meaning of the parts, then every part, in some sense, announces. I'm using his funny language more than it actually shows, because it already has to. Sh in its showing, it shows its position in the whole the way the note middle C, when heard in a certain melody, isn't just, let me, let's try this, I mean, the note middle C, if you hear it in this melody, has a certain quality, and if you hear it in another melody, it has another quality. In that funny sense, it refers to the melody, but it obviously doesn't have intentional content of any sort that points to the melody and that could be refuted by the melody failing to be what it was. It's more minimal. It's just that these experiences are not self-sufficient, but are what they are because of a whole field. If that helps any. Okay, we give it a try. But I'm glad you asked. I think that's very important, that there's this level of what he thinks of as meaning or significance, this word sens, but he doesn't think that it's reference. He doesn't think that it's intentionality. It's more basic than that. It, it points beyond itself, and that's why it looks like reference that it doesn't point beyond itself in the way that the intentional content in the mind points beyond itself at something in the world. Yeah? I was just going to say, it sounds like he's using significance the way Heidegger uses the word significance. It's just significance because it's part of the world. Yes, but, but I'd rather do it, I mean, if that helps the Heideggerians, good, but I want to do it in such a minimal way, like a spot, you know, Heidegger doesn't have a story about the significance of a, of a blah, a little ink spot on a white piece of paper. Merleau Ponty wants to get to that absolute minimum of meaningfulness, of, of, of interrelatedness, of who knows, we have no word for it, uh, but it's important. And he know. I mean, it's it's just basic to his Even view. Even the ink spot is, is part of the world. You just haven't really um, developed those associations. Okay, but it, just as soon as it's there, the ink spot on the white page already it's got the edges. It's already got denser on the at the toward the edges. It's already got a, 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 some sense that there's something it's covering up. That's just minimal. Uh, it. I wonder if I should get into this. It, that raises it. What I'm thinking of this week is my most puzzling question. Uh, let's do it right here where we're talking about sets. There's, there is a kind of body intentionality. I'll, I'll follow out what you guys are raising. Let's talk about looking at the front of a house. When you look at the front of a house, Merleau-Ponty says, it looks thick 
it looks like it, there's a back that's present but concealed. Or to take his extreme funny example, that he says twice in our reading, the last time and this time, that I have an experience of the, what's behind my back, of the room back there, which is present and concealed. This time not by something between me and it, but because I'm looking in the other direction. But it's present, and, it, and that's the same for him, and he underlines present as the way the background is under the spot. And that's all extremely important phenomenon for him. And he thinks that he's the only one that can account for it. Neither the intellectualist nor the empiricist can. Now, to, and, and how is it that... I'll, I'll do it first with the house, because that's the easiest. Why does the house look thick? Well, roughly, because I'm set to go around it. That's why the word set here so sets me off talking about this. I mean, it's because I'm... I'm already, my body is already not only ready to go around it, but in a certain sense already beginning to go around it in the, sen in, in the, in the way that I wouldn't, I mean, that, that it wouldn't throw me off or anything to just go around it. It's, it's not like I'm ready to, I'm not ready to just uh, do cartwheels. I'm ready to walk around and, uh, the objects when I need to. And so I'm set to do something. I really want to say something stronger. I'm really already coping with it. If, it. if it's in my experience as a house, and if I'm interested in, say, going inside or going to the back, even before I get there, I'm already coping with it. Uh, I have to give you a feel for that. We'll come back to this. But there is this talk in Merleau-Ponty about how if I'm going to leave the room, my hand is magically at the doorknob, he says. That's because as soon as I decide to leave my, the, ro the room, I'm already not only set to turn the doorknob, I'm already beginning to turn the doorknob. That I will uh, put on reserve, I guess I haven't done it, the uh, good ale, uh, what's the other guy? Mill and Mill and good ale stuff about actually filming people's hands getting ready as soon as they get ready to leave to begin to take the shape of the doorknob. That's, that's what he, that's what, Mar that's bottom line Merleau-Ponty. And in the same way, so that when you start to leave the room, when the bell rings and you aren't even out of your seat yet, you're already coping with the doorknob. Well, it's something like that when you're looking at a house and, and you're not just sit, sitting there in a sort of passive observer sort of way. You're either going around it or you want to go in it or something. Your body's already coping, not just with the facade, but with the whole house. And the, the idea then is, and behind me, well, why, how is it that, 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 this is the, 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 that I would feel different if I... See, I think I haven't explained something clear enough about the house in there. I'm trying to explain how it would look different if I thought it was a facade than it looks if I think it's a house. Because if I think it's a facade, if I believe it's a facade, without rationally believing it, if I'm on a movie set and everything's a facade, when I'm looking at this one, which I hadn't seen before, I certainly won't be getting ready to go through the front door because I'm, things are showing up for me as facades. <laughs> However, if I'm on a normal street, whenever I start moving toward a house, it's because, presumably, if I'm not just a painter or staring at it, I'm getting ready to go through the door. Now, what about behind me? Well, behind me, I take it that I'm constantly ready and taking account of that I could turn around and write on the blackboard. I would be, if there was a chasm behind me, it would, it, I, my body would be set to do things different, like not walk back and fall into the chasm, and it wouldn't be set to turn around and write on the blackboard. In that sense, I experience the background behind me. I am already set to deal with it. I want to really say, if I could make it the case, I'm already dealing with it by uh, being, dealing with there being something behind me besides a chasm, by being ready to back up. I also think I, it, it, you all would look different to me if I thought that you were looking at a chasm behind me, but that's, that I, I won't try to put into the equation. Now, that's all very clear and important. Well, let me finish this thought, and then you say something. I mean, here's a puzzle for you. I'm, it's puzzling me, so I'll give you all the puzzle about it. Uh, how do you deal with the, the background behind the spot? 
it doesn't seem to me that I'm set. Maybe you were going to say this. Is anybody going to say this? If so, you, you got the same problem I have. I, I don't know whether this, I mean, is my body in some way ready, set, already coping with what's under the spot, getting ready to lift up the spot and see what's behind it? I don't think so. And but yet that's supposed to be, I think, the same phenomena of the concealed present which you're already experiencing. Do we have to say that it's a tiny set, to just a tiny bit pick up the spot? And that seems always very squeamy. Uh, so I, you have an idea what we should say? No, no. <coughs> it's very I puzzling. You're going to yeah. no. I don't know either. And so, so is it wrong to think that it's because I'm set to go around the house and set to turn around and write on the board that I experience the back as there is present and the back side of the house is present? Is there some other story lurking in here that, equi that relates it to the spot more fundamentally than I see? Okay, big puzzle. I hope to have an answer, but I haven't got one now. You got something to say about it? Um, not about that puzzle particularly, but when you were saying what you did about um, having the backboard or the blackboard behind you and still uh, experiencing it um, and in some sense still using it, does that mean it's set to use it or already using right. it in some way? Or right, right. Does, does that mean that um, it's sort of that's sort of your like that background is sort of horizon and possibility? That's that too weak. That's too weak. It means that uh, this looks like even what's in front of me looks like a, a room with a wall behind me, and it isn't because I, this is very important, this is going to turn out to be a big issue uh, between me and Alva, I think, but I mean, I, it's supposed to be, it's not just possible that if I turn around I'll see the blackboard, but I'm already in some way coping with the blackboard, that's why it's present. I mean, see, Merleau Ponty is going to make a big fuss, you can keep this, your eyes open, that the, in, the, the intellectualist can only tell you about possible experiences. If I do this, if I turn around, I'll see the blackboard. Then that means that the blackboard is a possible experience. And he wants to say, no, no, the blackboard is an actual experience. I'm experiencing the blackboard now when I'm looking this way. And, and how to explain that it's got all to do with this business of the body being already involved and already coping even with stuff that it hasn't got in its visual field. And but we shouldn't go on with that now. But it's keep, keep your eyes open. That's a big question that we need to discuss <coughs> a lot and when we get there. And if we get there only fully when we get to the chapter on the thing because that's when you get this issue about the house and the back <coughs> of the house. But it's already brewing with the spot story. Okay, now, where are we here? Uh, the next thing is the two questions. Uh, the first time he got to the, the spot is right on the first page, I think, on, on four, uh, for us. The first page for you. Uh, well, the second page for us. I don't know, I think it's the first page in yours. And then again at the beginning of this chapter. Let me keep... I want to make sure I got, okay, we've done 26. Okay, 29, the last ch thing for us. He brings it back again. The phenomena of the background continuing under the figure and being seen under the figure. See that at the bottom of 29? And so he's done it three times. It's very important to him. He got it at the beginning of the, in the first, beginning of the first chapter, at the beginning of the second chapter, at the end of the second chapter. Uh, so he says the body, the, fi the, the background is seen under the figure when in fact it's covered by the figure. A phenomenon which embraces the whole problem of the presence of the object as obscured by the empiricist, who would only think that you could have association of the back as another determinate experience, and that's certainly not what he wants. Or notice halfway down on 29, the strange mode of existence enjoyed by the object behind our back. Um, And you see he's objecting to the empiricist view that these other aspects of objects are no more than permanent possibilities of sensation. We've got to abandon that or we won't understand the way the ground is beneath the figure or the back blackboard uh, present to me 
by it by and behind my back. Now, look, I've only got five minutes, but I do want to tell you what to look for in the inten attention chapter. Otherwise, I'll feel really I haven't done my job. Uh, I think I can summarize. Well, no, it's a long story, but let me try. Without reading anything from the book, tell you the story about attention. There, the attention is a kind of double agent. Attention, as we normally understand it, is like a spotlight which we show on things which doesn't affect the things that it's shown on. Now, Merleau-Ponty thinks that's all wrong. The, 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 there are two ways that attention can be uh, can function, and neither one of them is like that. One thing that attention enables you to do is take apart a whole into its elements by picking them out and paying attention to them. So that's how you can take apart the Muller liar illusion if you get good at it. And introspectionists could do it. Sort of don't pay attention to the end, just pay attention to the lines, break up the whole of this figure, and you'll see the lines are really the same length. Or look at the moon <coughs> illusion through a tube, which cuts out the whole context, and you'll see the moon is really the same size on the horizon. And that kind of attention, which is uh, analytic attention, which breaks down the whole and gives you the elements. And that kind of attention seems to support the Impressionist story. It seems to reveal the Impressionists. Now comes the other part. It's already there. Because you can break things down into the elements. And then if you think of attention as a searchlight, which only shines on things but doesn't change them, but only is you, you noticing them, then you get impressions because then you assume that the attention reveals the sensory core which was there all along. Since attention shows you elements, and since it doesn't look like it's breaking things down into elements, it looks like you're just noticing what was already there because you believe that attention is this neutral searchlight. So that attention can, uh, a certain view of attention, which isn't wrong, it can do that, it can break things down into the elements, but that combined with this view that the attention doesn't change anything, which is wrong, <laughs> according to him, gets you the Impressionist story. Now, but what else can uh, attention do besides this sort of negative job of breaking up holes and covering up the fact that it's broken up the holes? Well, it has this wonderful function of making new figures out of the background, where you bore into the background and bring out more and more of what is there. That's the positive role of attention. In both cases, attention changes things. It's not a neutral spotlight. In the first case, it changes things by getting rid of the context, by picking out the, the detail you're paying attention to, and thereby turning it into an element. In the second one, it changes things, but in the opposite way, it, 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 it exploits the figure ground structure which you go and you sort of, he says, sink yourself into and you can unwrap the, the, the background and bring it out as figure. Uh, I've jumped, I mean, that's, the whole, that's really the whole story about attention. Um, the, in the second positive uh, thing, he thinks that you're drawn to something. You, we have this expression, it drew my attention. So when you, when you, your attention is drawn to something and then you uh, unpack it. Uh, and the most beautiful statement of that, I'll stop with this, is way back on page 78 where he tells the story. You never know where anything is. I mean, you have to rewrite the book. To, but here's, I'll read this from 78 because this is the positive role of attention. To see an object is either to have it on the fringe of the visual field and be able to concentrate on it or respond to this summons by actually concentrating on it. When I, this is a concentrate his attention. When I do concentrate, that is focus my attention, uh, uh, when I do concentrate my eyes on it, I become anchored in it. But this coming to rest of the gaze is merely a modality of its movement. I continue inside one object, the exploration which earlier hovered over, over them all, and in one moment I close up the landscape and open the object. And then skipping to look uh, to the middle, to look at the object is to plunge oneself into it. And because objects form a system in which one cannot show itself without concealing others, the, the, okay, period, I start to start in the middle sense. More precisely, the inner horizon of an object cannot become an object without the surrounding objects becoming a horizon. And so vision is an act with two facets, and so forth. So, so there's uh, his nice example of the positive role of, of uh, uh, attention. 
I think I'm just going to go on and assume we've got it. We've done attention. There's only one point in that chapter, but just this nice one. Uh, and I'm going to start now rejudging for next time for sure in the phenomenal field. I'm going to stop.